and for the past eight years. And um, uh, I primarily work with schools in Washington and Hancock County, some northern Penobscot County. And um, one of the uh, reasons we're here today is because Linda and I were tasked to reach out to schools who have been identified in the tier one, tier two, and outside the 5% um, of tier three. And I'll give Linda a chance to talk about herself before we move forward. Hi, I'm Linda, and I'm happy to be here to meet with you all today. We're going to um, take you through some basic steps and then um, have some time for questions. Thanks for coming. Yeah, so, so what we want you to know is today is just an overview of sort of the identification process. And uh, Monique, the next slide, please. The next three slides are really um, what the department shows um, on every PowerPoint that they do. And the one that I highlighted was providing information and guidance, professional learning and support to schools and educators. Because of the main models of school support, you are um, you are uh, given the chance to have professional development and access to a regional coach. And this is what these meetings will actually be. Next two slides, Monique. Again, the strategic priority, and it's the same highlight. So the next slide. So um, this is just sort of, I'd like you to just take a moment and read that first paragraph. Mm. And so really, um, you know, everybody is on the continuous school improvement and um, what we are hoping to be able to provide you during the next few months and maybe the next couple of years is guidance and resources that you feel like you need. This isn't mm -hmm. going to be, besides today, with us going over um, sort of your identification and where you stand and what you need to do, the next months that are coming, we're going to be following your lead and hopefully giving you the resources that you need to be able to move forward with um, exiting from the main model of school support. Next slide. So the objective today is uh, there's a lot of people here, 71. I'm pretty excited about that. I was thinking maybe 15, 20 would come. So that's really nice. Um, we are going to review the main model of school support, talk about the identification timeline. It's just a review because most of you have already sat through um, the uh, slide decks and webinars that Monique provided in the spring. So it's just a review. Um, provide any other guidance on mm -hmm. your school profile. Discuss your options for your uh, CNA or continuous school improvement plan, and then gather information that can be addressed. And we want to share any resources and answer any questions. Does that make sense to anybody? Was if this wasn't thinking wasn't something you were thinking was going to happen today? Um, that that I'm sorry if we gave you the wrong impression, but that's where we're going today. So next slide. So who's joining today? And uh, there are too many, I think, for us to go through, 73 participants at this time, but I see a lot of names I recognize, and I see that there's a lot of schools all around the state, uh, uh, elementary school, middle schools, and high schools. Hi, Dan Clifford. And so um, our hope is that uh, after today, we will have time in the next few sessions to actually do breakout rooms where you can be working with like-minded folks on like-minded subjects. Next slide. So here's a copy of the main model of school support. It's also on the department's website. Mm -hmm. um, and it has been amended. In February, the uh, USDOE uh, gave approval for the amendments. And um, what you really need to understand in this slide 
is that there are three identifications. Uh, tier, well, there are actually four. There are tier uh, one, tier two, and tier three. And um, uh, all the tiers um, have the definition. So tier one, any school with one or more, um, and you are allotted professional development. Tier two, one or more, the same student populations experiencing for three years and you are allotted professional development and tier three outside the 5%. So there are um, schools that are identified uh, tier three who are receiving actual school support coaches. And then there are schools that are outside that 5%. And um, you have access to uh, regional coaches like Linda and I, as well as um, developing a plan and professional development. Next slide. So the model is run every year, but identifications are run are made every year for tier two, every three years for tier three, and every six years for tier one. And you remain on that status until your X criteria has been met. And um, uh, there, are di there are different exit criteria that you can move on to, and we'll go over that in a little bit. But the most important information is that you are on until that exit criteria is met. <coughs> Next slide, please. So you're not alone. Uh, I think most of you have seen this slide before. Uh, there are um, uh, there are a lot of identifications at a lot of time and a lot of um, and a lot of people, but let me just narrow it down to say in, in, in you're not alone, there are 160 schools in tier one status, 86 schools in tier two, 56 schools are identified in tier three outside the 5% and 51 or 53 inside that 5%. So you are not alone in this identification process. And I think when main models of school support was first, um, conceptualized back in 2016, 17, 17, 18. Um, it probably didn't think about all, I know we weren't thinking about what this would look like in the big picture. And I think Monique would agree with that as she um, continues to um, find different levels of different tiers in order to follow statute and um, USDOE requirements. Is there anything you want to add there, Monique? Yeah, I was just going to say that I was not here when the plan was originally <laughs> written or in the, the amendment. So we are in the process of that implementation of a plan. So hopefully we'll get a lot of these um, interpretations um, worked out and we wouldn't be making typically, I think I said this earlier in some of my other technical assistance webinars is that typically we wouldn't make identifications back to back, but because of USD and just different things um, that happened, we are. But moving forward, we should be able to follow the cycle that Amy just mentioned mm -hmm. about um, every year for tier two, every three years for tier three and every six years for tier one. Okay, next slide. So now you know the whole identification, how it works. Um, this is your, uh, this is the school profile. And I believe that most of you had gotten letters um, that had actual more information than is on the um, website of the ESD, uh, uh, the main DOE ESSA dashboard. And if you didn't, I linked it here when you get this slide, Jack, and this will bring you in to not only see um, your school profile, but your achievement goals. Um, it will also give you information about how many students tested, um, really a, li a little bit more detailed information. Um, I'm not gonna spend time going over this, but I will encourage you if you have questions about your school profile, that you reach out and also that you re-look at the webinars that Monique had done in the spring. And when we send out this slide deck, we'll be sure that we um, put links to those webinars so that you can go back in and see. 
Next slide. I just want to say that this, I just want to point out that this information on this um, URL is public information in that it is doesn't have any uh, uh, PPI. It doesn't have any to that level where you can identify students. It's just an area, it's just a URL that we created at the department because this, this has information that is not required to be posted publicly um, uh, uh, per statute, but it isn't really good information for schools to have. So it, you can give this out to anyone that you would like. Um, it's just, it doesn't have any student identifying or personally identifying information. Um, so it's a little bit different than the dashboard. The dashboard just kind of has the overall part. And then this one, um, the school profiles actually breaks the student population or groups out um, a little bit more. So that's the only difference. And then this is the um, what uh, anybody stakeholders that didn't have that information, this is where they could go to look at the main model of school support, which just really shows um, the emerging, the developing, the meets and the exceeds or um, uh, in that that information. It doesn't get into the nitty gritty of um, graphs or goals or um, student end counts. So moving on to the next um, three slides, this is sort of the exit criteria for tier one, tier two, and tier three. Uh, tier one is eligible to exit 2026. And really what the, the piece that to remember is that um, you are identified because at least one student population is experiencing challenges at, it, for emerging across all indicators and to exit with no support, no student population, to remain, to convert or to convert is that you remain, you stay status quo or things begin to not look as great as they were looking and depending on where they, you know, how they come. So every, every tier has its exit criteria and almost all exit criteria looks the same. It's what you've been identified for and where your eligibility is. So that's tier one. Tier two is the next slide. And again, this, one, this time it's one or more experiencing challenging for the same indicators over three years. And you can see those exit criteria. And the next slide is exit is tier is um, tier three outside of that five percent, and that's in main statute. And again, it's the same uh, across, and then the exit criteria, and then converting across. Any questions on that before we move to um, school improvement plans? Hey, just a quick question. If so, if somebody were in tier three in 22, 23, and then in 23, 24, they, the test results would meet like tier one. Am I understanding it doesn't matter? It's still it'd be three years out before they would move out of tier three? No. Um, and again, some of these slides are a little bit older um, and we're, it's kind of like a, as we interpret the plan and make it actually come to fruition and actually have like what it actually looks like, um, the most important thing is to meet the exit requirement. It's not staying in a status for so many years. It, the exit criteria is um, for tier three is that you have to have um, not all student populations experiencing challenges for two years in a row. So if you have, if that's the case, if you were identified in 22-23, if your school is identified in 22-23 for tier three status, because all student populations were experiencing challenges, then 22-23 would be a yes, you're meeting um, uh, identification criteria. In 23-24, if you didn't have all student populations experiencing challenges, you would have a no. So that's the one no. And then in 20, um, 24, 25, if you have another no, then your school would exit. So it has to be two no's or two years, identification years of not meeting uh, the identification status um, for that particular 
for tier two and sorry for tier three and tier one. Um, so it's about it's more about the exit criteria than it is about staying in a status for so many years. And I think where the three years came from was if you're identified in 22, 23, that's year one. And if you are you're still in it in 23, 24, that would be year two. And then in 20, 24, 25, that's year three. So you have to be in a status for almost three years because you have the first year, which is the yes, and then the two additional years, which would, would be the no. So that would be a total of three years. So that's where that three years is coming from. Um, but again, I I kind of switched um, based on interpretation and switched it more to focusing on the exit criteria versus staying in a status for so many years, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you so much for that clarification. Um, we're going to move on to school improvement plans. And so we're going to just go to the next slide. And everybody has um, seen um, this. This is a slide that really uh, goes for tier uh, folks that are in tier one status. It really should have gone the way that slide before, but we're going to follow it this way. So besides doing a um, a CNA, a school improvement plan, and having an evidence-based um, uh, evidence-based strategies. Uh, if you are identified in being a tier one uh, status, and really everybody should do this, you need to identify resource inequities. And so, um, resource inequities when you think about that, it really is the allocation and the use of resources. So it could be people, time, money, and you create a, which then creates a student experiences that enable children to reach um, rigorous learning outcomes. And so uh, no matter, you know, race or income or any of that. So not only identifying, identifying resource inequities, but then a plan that how you're going to address them will also be part of your CNA. Next slide. And this should have been the slide that came before and I apologize. So um, this is in everybody's. So no matter what tier uh, you are, you have a group of stakeholders that come together and you look at um, how to improve the outcomes based on those indicators in your not only, and I will say not only in your main statewide accountability, but also using your local data um, to improve student outcomes. And it should include evidence-based interventions. And here's the deal in tier one, tier two, and tier three status outside the 5% is that that CNA is improved by your, by your district, your SAU. It's monitored by your SAU and your SAU is watching to see if it works or not. None of this information will actually go to the Department of Education unless you are tagged to be monitored which is why all your documentation, you should be keeping that all at your level. And then if you are tagged to be monitored, they may ask, we need to see your school in continuous school improvement plan. Uh, next slide. I so, just wanna add one little piece um, yeah. about this. The SAU is responsible for monitoring it and the school is responsible for keeping track or keeping these um, plans. The other piece, though, is that um, school improvement is a part of ESCA, and ESCA does do um, yearly monitoring, depending on if your SAU has been selected for monitoring. So you would have to submit this these plans to the um, uh, to the department if your if your SAU has been selected for ESCA monitoring. So typically, the department would not be collecting these plans, but if your SAU has been um, selected for ESCA monitoring, um, then you would have to um, provide a copy of these plans to the department. And your essay, you should already know if they were selected for FY24-25 monitoring. Next slide. 
and so here's the here's the requirements here is that um, you are you develop a plan and the plan can be part of your district wide plan if you're not a school wide Title I school. It can be part of your SAU CNA or if it's part of your school wide SEA um, plan um, and that you are develop it with stakeholders that you are um, informing it by the main indicator, by the accountability system, and I would continue to say as well as your local data, um, and that you include one or more evidence-based interventions, and then here's your resource equity review. And when I send out this slide deck, when we send out the slide deck, um, I will also include some um, uh, links to some tools that could help you with your resource and equity, sort of kind of looking at that in a broad picture. You know, in an example would be um, uh, staffing. We all know staffing right now, teaching shortage is, is a real thing. And so what are the inequities when you're looking at who's teaching your kids? Like who who's certified, who's not? How do you how do you make amends for that? How do you provide extra support for teachers who may be in the process of getting their certification but not necessarily certified? That could be one example. Any questions on the CNA, the continuous school improvement plan? All right. Well, we are at the end. And this is a place where we are looking to you and um, it isn't necessarily something that you have to talk about now, um, but we are going to provide you with a link and um, Monique, if you could take that last uh, plus Delta feedback and drop it into the chat. Um, so folks have that, it's at the very last slide. What we're asking you now is, okay, so we are, your, we're your conduits. Um, for resources, for protocols, for any other information that you are like, if I'm identified and I don't have any funding, I want to reach out to the main DOE to get this information or this resource. And um, that's what we are here to do. And each month, we're going to drive the rest of this by, okay, so somebody really wanted to hear about what the main department of education is doing for multi-tier systems of support. And we would at our next meeting, invite the person from the main DOE to come and provide that sort of information for you. Or we're really looking for protocols to help us uh, uh, look through uh, teacher evaluations so that we're looking resource mm -hmm. equity. We can look for that for you and bring it back. So in the um, chat, is a link to the Plus Delta. And that's where we'll gather all your information and please um, feel free to add as much as possible so that uh, we can do that. There's a couple more slides that I know Monique wants to get through. And this is the first one. I just wanted to point this out because I did have a question that was in the chat. You wanna make sure that um, because tier one and tier two schools don't have separate applications in the grants for me. So you wanna make sure that in the FY26 ESEA consolidated application, you set up your tier one um, and your tier two and any tier three principles that are outside the 5%, you wanna set them up with these roles in the ESEA consolidated application in the address book, because when we send out grants for me notifications, like when we send out this recording or the link to this recording, which will be on Maine's YouTube and the slide deck, which will be a PDF version of the slide deck, everyone will get that copy because it'll they'll be in the message. And we're also sending it out to the ESEA coordinators and also the superintendents. We pretty much send everything to the superintendent um, but yeah, so this, if you're not receiving notifications, you want to just make sure the address book has been set up for those principles. 